John Brooks here. Today I'm going to be speaking all about reading. Reading, note-taking, memory, multiple books, single book, speed reading, skimming, everything you can think about today I go into with Justin Knopp. Justin is an international learning expert who I've already spoken to extensively on the topic of general learning in a podcast I did with him on a high existence. But I wanted to sit down with him today to talk specifically about reading, how we can get more from the books that we read. I found reading to be one of the most transformational practices that I do, but I had some questions and doubts about how I was doing things. So I figured I'd ask Justin and I took a lot from it. I now have like four to five things that I'm gonna be doing from this day forth on optimizing my reading. So I really hope that you take something from it too. And uh, it's very practical, it's very concise. And uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. I hope this helps. This is my conversation with Justin Knopp on reading. The first conversation I ever had with you, we covered everything, I think nearly everything on learning that I could think of in, in the two hours or so that we spoke. And I really liked the, the, the areas of the conversation where you talked about reading. You had like a lot mm. of really useful ideas about reading. I'm a huge reader. Um, I haven't been reading that much lately, but it's still a daily habit. And I have found reading to be one of the best practices for self-improvement. And I know that you're a big reader. Uh, you, mm. You've read so many books. You've recommended some really good ones to me. So what I'd like to do in this conversation is talk about the mechanics of reading, talk about how we can optimize our reading and cover everything from note taking to getting ourselves into the right state when we read, um, the actual process of reading itself. Um, so sound good? Sure. Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. So let's just start with reading as being like there being a beginning, a middle and an end to reading. So the beginning, to reading might be like the preparation that might be like getting yourself into the right state so whether that be like sitting should we drink coffee like how do you when you're about to read a book prepare to get the most out of it to learn the most that's a <clears throat> so this is a great question and i find this very similar to like the morning routine question what is your best morning routine and what i would actually say is um, make reading like breathing so instead of hyping yourself up to get into the state where I'm going to do a reading workout, rather just say, I'm going to read half a page. Right now, I've got, I've got five minutes. I'm standing in the kitchen waiting for the kettle to boil. I'm going to do half a page. And, and building up those little moments actually accomplishes a lot more and ties you in. And that's the secret. It ties you in emotionally to what you're reading rather than anything else. So when you're going about your, your average day, you're always opening a book and like diving into a page where you left off. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Just like dipping into a book I, frequently? Absolutely. You know, you gotta, you gotta take it with your energy as well. And uh, every time you're gonna choose to do something, reading is, is another option. And so it's just, it's building up and exercising that habit to make the choice of reading. And so I normally read about five to 10 books at a time and they're scattered all throughout my house. And depending on my mood and what I'm in the mood for or which room I'm in, I'll pick up a different book, let's say, or, you know, I'll crack the spine on something different. So it's definitely this idea of organizing your environment and your time around how you feel. So that's actually one of the things I wanted to get into. You see people uh, have many different opinions on, you know, you should read one book, focus on that one book, go deep into that. Other people say that, you know, have multiple books going so you can connect the topics between the books and get new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, where do you fall on that spectrum? Obviously, uh, like I said in multiple books, but have you ever sure. gone really deep into a book? You know, yeah, you absolutely, that? absolutely. I, I think um, I think having a couple of gears inside your, let's say, your ability is a very important thing. So, for example, if you're going to go into one of those focused gears, the idea is that, uh, like when I read The Black Swan, I dedicated half an hour a day to reading, 
and in a coffee shop with a cup of coffee and everything and, and, and made that my environment for reading and program my brain. But I would read only one page in that half an hour and try and digest as much as possible in that half an hour. It took me forever to read the book, really. I mean, I might have, you know, like strayed from that rule in particular, but it, it was by far one of the most enjoyable books that I've ever read. And I'm very happy that I dedicated that time. But if I did the same thing with another book that's not quite as powerful, I would have felt like it's a waste of time. So the other gear that I have is the idea, and it's a neuroscientific approach really, the more that you, you put a book down and sleep in between your, your sessions of, of feeding yourself this information nutrition, the better digested that information is going to be. And every time you come back to it, you have to remind yourself, wait a minute, what was I reading? Was that this book or that book? And by doing that, that reminding, you're actually you know, consolidating a lot more of that information. Mm -hmm. uh, what about speed reading? I know that's a big topic. You've just wrote an article for high existence on this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, speed reading is really about comprehension and familiarity with reading. And so when people are like, well, I need to improve my reading speed. There's a lot of things that give you a placebo effect, a false confidence, you know, like all of the you know, using your finger as a marker to kind of pace yourself. Um, they give you a false, a false sense of confidence, but that sense of confidence translates into a faster reading speed. But if you take all of those away and you just ask somebody to read more, their familiarity with grammar structure, with vocabulary choice and lexicon within a particular thing, just means that they're going to be able to process that information at a much higher rate. But after 500 words per minute, comprehension starts to decrease significantly. So anyone who can assumingly speed read more than 500 words per minute and understand the topic, it's probably likely that they've, they've got a great familiarity with the topic already. And it's just confirming information rather than anything else. Or, you know, it's giving information in a particular way to something that they've heard before. So if anyone out there thinks that they're a speed reader and that I'm talking a load of horse shit, um, go, sorry, a horse blank, um, Go and, you know, test yourself in areas that you're not familiar with. Grab a university textbook in a subject you have no idea. Uh, perhaps read a work of fiction. And you'll notice that you won't be able to do this, especially if the work of fiction is like Moby Dick. It's one of my favorites because they really change the grammatical structures around and it makes you pay attention to it. You can't speed read that type of stuff if you're not familiar with it. And I suppose you'd have to also analyze why you want to speed read. Right, because there could be some sort of shady intention there, where you you don't already have a good reading practice, and you think that if you learn this technique, suddenly you will. When in fact, right, you can probably. I, I know that you sometimes tell people to read slower, not faster. Mm. So a lot of people want to speed read, and and without going into uh, the mechanics of reading, you can actually fix your reading practice by just going into your intention and 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 fixing this. Whatever most people want to do, they want to do it faster because they don't enjoy it. They see the process as being, you know, bothersome, but the result as being something that others value or that they might want so that they can get something else. They don't, they don't value that result in and of itself. It's an instrument to get to the thing that they really want. For example, like reading a college textbook. Why? So they can just get the degree. Why? So they can get a good job so they can get money because what they want is money or they want the job or something like that. And really, it's just about the process. So you've got very different motivations or intentions to read. And the idea is locking in and being honest with what is yours. And if, you, if you're one of these people who want speed reading, maybe you just have a lot of books that you want to read. And that's fine. But then you need a system. You don't need speed reading. You need a system of processing all of these books without feeling overwhelmed, like a way to pre-qualify them, dedicate and allocate correct amounts of time to each book. Um, that will solve that problem. And so there's, there's other things that you can do, and I can give you examples for all of them, but the answer is very simply put, the intention behind speed reading is because people don't enjoy the reading and they want the result more. Hmm, that's great. So I'm curious then, I, I like what you said about like categorizing certain books. What do you do when someone is like, Justin, I recommend this book to you? And it sounds good to you. What's like, how do you sort that out? I'm sure you have so many books you want to read or that you are reading. How do you make sense of this new uh, title? So I'm very lucky because I've actually spent a lot of time on my own, a lot of time reading. So I've read a lot of the books that I want to read. The books that are attractive to me, I've read. 
already. And there's, there's a world of books out there, but a lot of me has come to this place where um, it's, it's not something that bothers me anymore, I think is a good way to say it. Um, so when someone gives me a book, uh, I do a qualifier. Like, why is this book important to that person and why do they think it's appropriate for me? A lot of people um, will make recommendations because they think they understand where you're at and they think that this book will help you in a profound way because it affected them profoundly. And so I'm not going to poo-poo their recommendation straight away, but I'll take it. I'll be like, oh, yeah, thanks. This is great because I don't want to... I don't want to damage that relationship, but normally like I'll, first of all, I'll go through who is recommending it and do they, do they understand things similar to me or different from me? Like what's their perspective? Because they might be giving that book a lot more weight than I would. After that, I would then pre-read the book and I would do a qualifying read and a qualifying read shouldn't take more than 20 minutes. And that qualifying read will then whet my appetite a little bit more or confirm, oh, that perspective yeah, it's given too much weight. So I'll dedicate a little bit of time to this book. The pre-read is really what it is. But I always weigh that other person's um, location in their journey into account to see, like, are they recommending it because it was appropriate for them and they just want to share their, their energy, which is a beautiful thing anyway. What does a pre-read look like? Uh, skimming. For, for most people who say that they speed read, they're mm -hmm. actually just skimming. And so like a skim read is really trying to read everything except, except for, for the, the text. text. Titles, graphs, charts, bullet lists, summaries, epilogues, you know, conclusions, anything uh, like that. Titles, um, you can't do that with Nassim Talib's books because he writes the most bizarre titles and there's no way to understand what he's writing unless you actually read the text. But for most, most works of fiction, uh, nonfiction, you can absolutely do this. You know, you can go through all of it and just get a good map, a good lay of the land and see like, okay, cool. Well, I've got a good idea of what I'm going to get out of it. Please don't get me mistaken. You can still get some amazing things out of it that you didn't get in the pre-read. But the, the, this qualifying read allows you to, um, to just make better decisions about it rather than just dedicating the same amount of time to each book, which is the danger. See, this is very interesting because a lot of people who do read books don't do this pre-reading, you know, because I know a lot of people who read books and I, I've never heard of them, you know, like I'm going to dedicate 20 minutes to doing this like structured skimming type thing. And it's kind of win-win because if you don't choose to read the whole book, you would have still picked up some useful ideas. And if you do decide to read the book, then you've chosen a good book to read. So it's like, absolutely. absolutely. And I guess you yeah, could also go to a bookstore and do the same thing, right? Yeah. And, and like, it's a good way to kind of value books, you know, you just have maybe a cover or a name catches your eye. And so like a lot of people will, will buy a book based on that first impression and I'll say, okay, that first impression warrants 20 minutes. It's the same as when you introduce yourself to someone, you, you know, they say like, well, you know, what do you do? You've got like three seconds before their interest is gone. And then if you catch their interest again, you've got about a 30 second window to catch their interest again before they say, oh, tell me more. And then you've got like three minutes before, you know, their attention will be like, oh, that's very interesting. Okay, cool. Let's change the topic. So you've definitely got these windows of opportunities of focus. And it's just using that within reading instead of just saying, oh, this book looks cool. And then trying to ride that wave of initial energy, you'll, you'll definitely go down. But doing a quick, another pre-read, you know, sorry, another qualifying read to get that energy up or just to remain stable, and, and you start to allocate right amounts of energy and passion because it's always about what do you connect with rather than what is, you know, uh, you know, unequivocally the best book. You know, no, there is no such thing. It's always what is your best book. One classic reading problem that I've both experienced and spoken to a lot of people who have experienced is this idea of never finishing what they read, you know, like starting all the time, getting really excited and then stopping and then getting another book. So there's all these like 50% read books. Um, what's going on there and how can we finish or should we finish or should we just start books? And, you know, how do you make sense of that? Humans have this innate need to complete something. So, uh, being mindful of that, you'll start to notice in your life. So if I go, dun, 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 dun. You know, your, your brain probably just finished it. Even if you don't verbalize it, you're just like, that, that guy is trying to manipulate my brain. And you know exactly what it is. And it's, this is just part of um, your brain's 
pattern recognition system to be able to predict endings of things and confirmation of those things as well. And so for you to finish an action that you've taken is, yes, it's important for your brain, but it actually isn't important for life. So if you get halfway through the book and you've decided you've gotten enough out of the book, then uh, the biggest point that I can say is that I'm against feeling guilty or shameful for any action that you've taken. And so, uh, I mean, within reason, of course, but um, like if you're feeling guilty because you haven't read a book, you know, examine that, look at that, because you're actually just doing more damage to yourself. You're actually creating a whole host of chemical processes that won't do you any favors. If anything, they, they're going to um, really push you down, stifle yourself. So I don't, I don't care about that. If a book, if I get 50% 50, 50 into a book and I just don't pick it up again, I'm like, I'll come back to it later. Or when I die, I'll just get access to all that knowledge anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> I think the whole like, don't feel guilty or shameful is so big. I think like shame and guilt and like lack of self-esteem is directly linked to the self-improvement uh, area because, Huge. you know, it's like you have such Huge. big goals. Yeah. Got to watch and that crap. And just on that as well, there's this idea of like there's social pressure to read certain books. What? You haven't read blah, 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 blah by so-and-so, you know, come on, what are you doing? But if we all read the same books, we're all, we're all going to think the same. We're all going to know the same information. That would make for a very boring world and very boring conversation as well, you know we can get inspiration from like the weirdest of places. And uh, yeah, when, when I tell people some of the books that I've read, they're like, what? But if you tell someone that you're reading, they're like, oh, you should read this top 100 list of books to read before you die. There's no doubt that those are great books, but they're also popular books. And so like, great, well, you know that they're there. They're always gonna be there. Go and find something else that takes your passion as well. Mm -hmm. So let's go into reading lists a little bit. Um... Have you ever found a thinker that you like and seen his top 10 books or her top 10 books and thought, wow, I'm, I've got to read all these? Or like, how do you deal with reading lists? Uh, I think if I'm, if I'm exploring a topic, then, then I'll definitely go into a reading list. Like if I'm learning about business finance or something like that, I'll look at the top 10 business finance books or something like, you know, along those lines. Very often... Um, you've got books that introduce you to a topic. And of course, I'm going back to nonfiction as well. I normally don't put any, any energy whatsoever into autobiographies. I'm not interested in people's uh, stories, especially nowadays. They're usually ghostwritten. And so it's over dramatized kind of stories where their actual life story, it, it's probably better on a podcast, you know, where people are interviewing them. Um, so definitely with nonfiction, I'll pay attention to those. But I tell you what, there's, a, there's an Amazon bookstore up the road here. And all it is, is it's the books, the physical books laid out on uh, shelves that say top 10 books in California, top 10 books in the world on this topic, on this topic, or the best sellers in business here. And they, they organize it kind of like Amazon, uh, like you see on the website. And it's amazing because it just... You know, people who enjoy this book will also enjoy these books and they can give you those types of recommendations, which you don't get in a bookstore. And those catch my eye. I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And then you have to calm yourself down and just leave the store and, you know. Amazon's a great place to find your next read as well, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Birds of a feather flock together and Amazon really used that well. Mm -hmm. um, so on the topic of remembering what you read, you know, this is a big, big one. Many of us, we read a book and then two years later, it's like, it's kind of about this, you know, but yet we still love reading. We find it so transformational. <laughs> like, do you think, so let's break it down a little bit. Do you think that um, if you read a book, even if you don't like remember it in like in a formal test a couple of years later, it's still beneficial because it sort of changes the course of your life in some way? So without a doubt, I, I always give people this metaphor and, and it definitely reminds me and, and, tells me and helps me remember to slow down. It's the metaphor of food. And so like speed reading is kind of like force feeding food into your mouth. And if you've got too much, you can't chew. So the chewing is really the thinking, the comprehension, the, you know, like, huh, let me think about this. And those processes are like the first part, like when you actually swallow it, that's putting it into your memory. And then the digestion of it is, is how it integrates into your life. And a lot of people will actually just chew food and spit it out. 
they don't actually, uh, you know, digest it. They don't make it part of their lives. They don't actually put it into their memories. Especially speed readers, they'll buzz through a book and put it down and be like, yeah, it was a great book. And you're like, great. And? Mm, well, it was, a, it was kind of about this. I'm like, who cares what it was about? Like, what has it changed in you? Or rather, has it given you some kind of like, you know, motivational juices or inspiration about like what you want to change in your life? Like, uh, I was actually talking about this the other day. Moby Dick is one of the books that uh, that really shifted me because of the way that they used metaphor and they made a comparison between iron and gold. And I'll never forget that, you know. Um, and, and the point is, is that that's changed me. Even though you might not notice it in my life, I can feel it change and I'm noticing different things. Now, um, when you talk about, you know... Um, Let's take the famous Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? Like, I read that book and there was nothing in there that was something that would really change my life. So I ate the food, you know, I chewed on it. I put it in my mouth, I chewed on it. And again, I was speed reading at the time, so I force fed myself, chewed on it. And I digested it. It went into my long-term memory for a while. Wasn't interested in remembering, so of course that faded, and I wasn't interested in integrating it into my life. And so there's there is this four step process of like, fine, how much can you take in at one time, and then after that, spend some time reflecting on that information, and then after that, can you remember that information like a while later, and after that is have you integrated that information into your being, into who you are, how you think, and how you act, and if you're not reading books. To, to think about them and do this type of thing, then I'm going to challenge you to answer, isn't it just a vanity metric then? You know, to say, I've read 52 books this year. Great. How many of them changed you? Uh, well, maybe one, you know. Well, what was the point of the other 51 books? And then I think a second, a second part to that is then going to be... Um, when you, when you, you know, it's kind of tough, but when you talk about this type of stuff, uh, a lot of it is uh, a vanity metric. And I think that's an important thing to, to consider. I'm, I, I think uh, I wanted to go into this long ramble and I'm going to stop there. Vanity metrics, just challenge yourself. Be careful how much, how much of it is, is just, you know, really affecting you. That was kind of cool to see you in real time have like these different places to take the conversation and like, no, 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 I'm going <laughs> to stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> there was like a whole direction you could have gone to be continued <laughs> yeah the vanity metric is huge like such a big thing and that vanity metric stops people from rereading books which can be so yeah. like because that's like repetition uh, you know from a learning mm-hmm. perspective if you if you read something then going back to the materials can only be a good thing right if you want to oh, yeah. if you want to remember it oh yeah oh yeah absolutely um, so say that someone does find a book, like for me, this would have been a book like nonviolent communication, which was kind of like a workbook on how to communicate compassionately and effectively. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just like an interesting read that I picked some ideas up, up from. It was a book that I read and I was like, this is going to be hard to actually do in the world. I want to really master this. I want to get good at it. So when you read a book like that, where it's got information that you actually want to apply to life and, and remember and actually use how would you go about sort of chunking that down and, I don't know, making drills from it? Or would you take notes? How would you do that process? So a good thing, a good thing to remember is that, uh, or a good target to come into a book with, is the idea that nine-tenths of a book is filler, especially like nonfiction that we're talking about right now. Nine-tenths is filler, which means that like just on a qualifying read, you're going to stumble upon like these profound points and they're normally marked out anyway. But um, profound points for you, I normally go for one or two big, big, big points that'll influence me per book. One or two. So even a book, um, you know, a book that's that's got like step by step in skill one, skill two, skill three, etc. I will go for an overarching one or two points. The more you can solidify, solidify it down, the better you're going to be. And so what I would suggest is that um, if you're close enough to a certain lesson, then leave it, but go for the one that's going to move the needle the most. And so it's always this idea that we think for us to be successful, we need to take a book that's, let's say, got 10 skills in it and master each chapter because that's that autocomplete function of the mind. 
And instead of that, just saying which one is the most important. By channeling it down to one thing, you're going to find a lot more focus and a lot more inspiration. That's it. One thing. Revisiting that book once that one thing is integrated into your life and then doing a second and a third and a fourth. Now, if you don't have the luxury of the time to do this, then definitely it's going to be a matter of um, solidifying it down into a smaller sentence as possible as a reminder. And so I like post-it notes because they're temporary, because over time that stickiness fades, just like over time the prompts that you need from them should also fade. So they should be, uh, you know, sticky notes in places where you're going to see them regularly to remind you of those points. And each reminder will help you then integrate those points into your life. So definitely if it's more of a form of study, you know, go through it with highlighters, pens, pencils, colors, um, you know, the brain responds to doodling, drawing pictures for you to be able to reframe it. And this is a whole host of um, skills that come into note taking, which has... You know, like uh, I've trained, um, you know, executives in, in taking notes because the science behind it is very interesting where, you know, they compared classes of, I think it was second graders who were doodling and those who weren't allowed to doodle and then test results of the ones who were allowed to doodle were actually better. So, you know, doodle, pictures, colors, your brain is stimulated by these things, drawings, re, you know, repurposing it or, or explaining it in your own words or drawing like flow charts. There's a lot that goes into being able to reformulate something. So instead of just repeating, try and reformulate. That's one of the best things that I can say that's in a nutshell. Reformulate. Mm, reformulate. That's great. Very useful. I've heard Jordan Peterson talk about um, the advice that he gives to his students is if you're preparing for a test or something, to read something and close the book and try and like actively teach it or like speak it out out loud mm. what you just mm -hmm. read yeah that's reform reformulation right there right i so i would say that's reformulation the other the other part to this is um so the brain has something called the working memory and one of the jobs of the working memory is the like this phonological loop kind of like when i tell you my phone number and you have to repeat it a couple of times and then write it down now if you're reading something that loop is going to convince you that you know it and when, as soon as you close that book yeah, you might keep it for like another two minutes at max. Depends on the, the length of material or your familiarity again. But chances are you're not going to be able to access that loop anymore. And once it's gone, it's gone. This is one of the first filters of memory. And so um, you need to be aware of that, to be aware of when it's actually, you know, the audio loop versus your memory that knows the information that you're reading. So I always tell people, don't read and speak at the same time. You know, read it. Put it in your memory and then try and speak it because even the act of speaking will move it from that short term loop into longer kind of processes that have to balance a whole host of other things as well. So any type of physical action that you can do where you're doing it by recall rather than recognition. So it's recall always over recognition. Recognition is it's there's some kind of stimulus provided for you and you're just like auto completing it or just going straight off that stimulus, just like reading or reading a gapped text or something like that. Whereas recall, it's close your eyes. How much can come up naturally? So recall versus recognition. Important distinction there. One of the things that I sometimes do is if I read a book, uh, like a physical book, and I like it and I, I think there's a lot in there, I'll then get the audio book version uh, because the because I've already I'm kind of familiar with it. The audio book is a lot easier just to take in, and if I miss a part, it's not a big deal. And then I'll like just listen to that as I'm going about my day. I find that to be like a very nice way just to get reminded of the oh yeah, that's an important thing that I, that mm -hmm. I missed in the first read. Yeah. Do you think that um, there's just as much value in audio books as there is in physical books? Do you like audio books yourself? Uh, I think there's obviously there's merits in all these different forms. So, for example, like, you know, having a physical book versus a Kindle or an e-book, you know, e uh, a PDF version of it, um, and then audio books. Um, I think there's, there's definitely merit to each one of those points. Uh, something that I really enjoy now is when people summarize books on, uh, on YouTube and they make videos with their experience reading it. I do enjoy that as well because, like, I'll actually watch videos of people talking about books that I've read 
and seeing like, did we get the same stuff? That's quite interesting. So it's a nice confirmation or, you know, a point of like, oh, I actually see the world a little bit differently and I got different information because it was relevant for me. So I do like all of them. I, without a doubt, I do. And I do revisit books if I found them valuable. So um, there's no, for me, there's no one over the other. There's just revisiting books that were meaningful that I want to incorporate a lot more in my life. And I think that go, connects back to what we were talking about earlier, about like digestion and integration. You can't do that with every book. And I think that I didn't mention that and I would like to point that out. Choose which books you want to integrate into your life. So a lot of the time I'll chew, you know, I'll put, put information in my mouth, I'll read that book and I'll think about it and I'll decide this is not for me or no, I don't really value this and let it go. So I'm going to be taking all of the information in this, in this interview and making a really compact cheat sheet that I'm going to publish on high existence. You know, and it's going to be a lot already. I can tell there's a lot of principles and stuff in there, which is going to be great. Um, but earlier on, you mentioned this idea of, you know, if, if there's a book that you want to really digest, take the one thing and sort of focus on that. Um, let's, let's just like, we'll, we'll wrap up now, but let's just say that what can people focus on? What's like the one or two things that, you know, if, if people are going to want to get the most from their reading and want to remember the most, like what are the most important things for people can, that can, can start implementing from today on to improve their reading? I think, uh, let's say the, the one or two things that are probably going to be the best. Let's assume that you're reading already and let's assume that that you're going to take these things into account and, and you're reading nonfiction or whatever. As soon as you find something that is profound for you that you're like, whoa, don't read. Stop, close the book, start thinking, start writing down your ideas so that when you open the book again, you can keep reading and you can see how much these ideas actually connect with what you were thinking as well. Um, you can reread that section that was so powerful for you. Okay, so when you encounter a powerful point, stop, think, write down ideas, talk about things with people. It doesn't need to be a fully formed uh, point that you agree with. It's just, it's just a concept or an idea or a question that really excited you. As soon as you have that, stop reading, right? Start thinking. It's the idea of stop forcing food in your mouth and chew. Your, your mouth now has just encountered a delicious flavor. Take some time to savor that flavor, right? So that's... That's the first point. The second point is that let's say you read a book and you went through it and you didn't have any of these like flavor sensations that really caught your attention, but it was a good book and you enjoyed it. It's the idea of sitting down, reflecting on that book. And of course you can keep it out and, you know, go through it if you want just to remind yourself, but take maybe 10 to 15 minutes and come out with what was the one thing in this book that really moved the needle for me. See, what I love about these is that they are very low hanging fruits. They're not super time intensive and anyone who reads can do them. And it intuitively feels like the benefits to doing these would be huge. Um, mm. If you're going to spend hours reading anyway, right? Like you're going to get through multiple books a year or, or a month. Why not, as you said, just like at the end of a book, reflect on it. Like, like, how is that not going to be a good use of your time? It's, it's like a really good use of your time. Say you read a three or 400 page book and you stop 20 times throughout the book and close it and reflect over the course of a year, how much more of a, of an insight are you going to get into like life and, and improved perception is huge. It's really, really exactly. useful. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, um, sorry, very quickly. There's a, there's this point of, um, it's just, it's just making sure that we're not falling victim to this idea of completion and tying completion with success, you know, and it's like, oh, I finished a book, therefore I feel better. And, and it's gonna, it's, it's a natural feeling in your body. Don't feel guilty about it, but be aware of it and just be like, am I a person who's going to brag about finishing this book or am I a person who will find more of my personal pleasure in identifying a part and really enjoying it? And I think this is, this is where it comes in. You can bring in a lot more emotional engagement by engaging socially. So like reading something, starting a discussion with people, you know, book clubs are fantastic versions of this where they give you a chance to socially digest information 
and see and bounce off other people. So I like book clubs, but I don't because they force people to read these books in these times. But if accountability is your thing, like I don't like exercising in groups either. I prefer to exercise, you know, to the beat of my own drum, you know, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that. That's really useful. Okay. So we've covered a lot of things. Um, I'm going to put the, so there's going to be a detailed article that's going to go along with this. I'll put that in the description. I'm going to link to our first podcast where we talk about learning and we go into reading as well, actually, in that too. Um, you have a learning course coming out soon. I don't know if that's going to be out, but it, when it is out, I'm going to link to it or I can link to the sign up so you can be notified when that's coming out. And I know that some people listening to this will, will want to work with you one-on-one -on -one or just speak to you about how they can improve their note-taking, their mm. reading, their ability to learn. So I'll put your information as well in the description. Thank you. And uh, yeah, if people like this, we can do more. So let us know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, John.